Hello, and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Dr. Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new Teen Therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. His latest book, Feeling Great, contains powerful new techniques that make rapid recovery possible for many people struggling with depression and anxiety. Dr. Burns is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. (laughs) Hello, Rhonda. Hello, David. And welcome, everyone, to episode 310. Welcome to our listeners around the country and across the world. We have a very special guest today, our most beloved, Jill Lovett. Hi, Jill. Hi, Rhonda. Thank you guys for having me. You're very beloved to me, too. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> We're excited to have you, Jill. Anytime I work with you, it's just so much, so much fun and so fantastic, and cool things seem to happen. <laughs> yeah, and there's so much learning whenever you're around, Jill. Just It kind of just flows out of you with ease. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Yeah. Well, let me start by reading one endorsement about podcast 302, which was the part two of the personal work that you did with Nosley that we titled, Why Am I Like This? Live Work with Nosley. And this was from Brian. And Brian wrote, Thank you for the podcast, David, Jill, Rhonda, and Nosley. I really appreciated your exchange regarding the positive reframing. I found it difficult in the past to convince myself that the things that are making me miserable are somehow positive or helpful. And I have often found myself just going through this step without any genuine conviction. It was Nosley's protest that she was not happy to feel shame or guilt, coupled with David's response that each of the emotions was a double-edged sword. That gave me a much greater understanding of this step in the team process. For example, the merits of being humble have been espoused to me while I'm trying to positively reframe my emotions, and I've always protested. Being humble for me in the past has genuinely, genuinely led to my being overly passive and feeling a serious lack of self-confidence. I see now that I don't have to try to convince myself that the negative emotions are 100% positive and helpful in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary. But just imagine how I would be if they were at 0%. For example, an excess of shame and guilt has done me far more harm than good. But I really wouldn't like to be a person with no shame whatsoever, as then I'd be the type of arrogant narcissist that I have little time for. I hope I'm making sense. Thank you, as always, for your life-changing podcasts. Brian. Well, that's a great one. Thank you, Brian. And uh, we're doing some... Some revisions in the app. Uh, we're always trying to make the app more effective, and uh, I'm going to be uh, emphasizing that a bit in the uh, n- next iteration of the positive reframing section of the app. And a lot of people on our team resonated with it as well, our app development team. So thank you for that, Brian. I was uh, glad it was helpful for you, and uh, your comment was appreciated, but also helpful uh, for us. Yeah, so um, you guys have an upcoming day-long workshop, October 2nd. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Yes, yes, we can, and there's a fantastic (laughs) introduction uh, that Jill is now going to provide. (laughs) Uh, I don't know about that, but yeah, we, um, David and I are doing a day-long workshop that will be live and online, so you can join from anywhere in the world um, on... uh, So on treating social anxiety, and we'll focus on sort of motivational factors, things that uh, get in the way, sort of resistance to um, overcoming social anxiety, resistance to doing exposure for social anxiety. We'll cover some cognitive strategies using the daily mood log, identifying distortions, some cognitive role-playing strategies. And then we hope to focus a lot actually on getting out of the office and getting into the real world. So showing therapists how to do really good exposure with their patients who have social anxiety, because 
we know that if you change your negative thoughts, your anxious thoughts or your distorted thoughts, but you never change your behaviors, then you're not actually overcoming your anxiety. And so something that I think is really hard and challenging and maybe even scary for a lot of therapists is, is doing exposure with their patients and even getting out of the office and doing it collaboratively with them. So we're going to focus a lot um, on the workshop on teaching a whole bunch of actually really fun, um, but kind of sometimes scary uh, strategies for helping your patients to overcome social anxiety. And Jill, if somebody wants to take the class with you guys, but has a conflict in their schedule, will they be able to listen to the recording or how do they do that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if people are interested in registering, they can register on the website. We have a specific website just for the workshop, which is www.cbtforsocialanxiety.com. So the word CBT or the letter is CBT and then for like the word F-O-R socialanxiety.com. And it is a live workshop and actually therapists will get continuing education credit for attending the workshop. But if you can't attend live, if you register for the workshop, we send, uh, we share a video of the whole workshop with everyone who registers just a couple days after the workshop. So you can't get CE credit for watching the recording, but you can enjoy and in, you know engage in all of the learning and you can watch the recording after it. The other thing just to mention that I think is really cool about these workshops and basically all the teaching and training that, that David does and that we do at Feeling Good Institute is that there's an opportunity for therapists to practice. So we'll do some teaching, we'll do some demonstrations, but then we'll also break people into kind of breakout groups online and they can actually practice the strategies and there's helpers who are able to kind of facilitate practice. The therapists will really learn a lot, you know, by the end of the day. Is it only for therapists or can non-therapists come? David, why don't you tell them about that? Well, this is, I, I've been trying to twist the arms of the people at the Feeling Good Institute to let uh, general public, uh, you know, non-therapists into the workshops because I think a tremendous amount can be gained. And and especially in this one, uh, bec- and, and also if you're a therapist and you want to come for your own social anxiety, that's a good reason to, to come as well. I think in our Tuesday group at Stanford, it seems to me that a good 90% of the therapists have social anxiety that's often s- severe. And and so you can come not only to learn these techniques, uh, but also to do your own healing. Or if you have a son or daughter who is very uh, socially anxious and feeling insecure or lonely, doesn't know how to connect with friends and so forth, uh, but it, it might be right up your alley to to come. Um, what what are all the, the you know? There's five kinds of social anxiety that are mentioned in the DSM, and in my easy diagnostic system, I have uh, five short three item scales for each of those uh, forms of social anxiety. Should we tell our folks what are the different kinds of social anxiety? Sure. Okay, because I thought you were saying, no, let's stop telling. Exactly. No, we'll withhold (laughs) that information. (laughs) You'll have to come on October 2nd to find out. (laughs) Yeah, the, uh, well, the most common one is, you know, probably just shyness. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you've got public speaking anxiety. And then you've got performance anxiety. And then you've got shy bladder and bowel uh, syndrome. That's people who are afraid to take a leak or have a poop in a public <laughs> restroom where other people might might see them or might hear might hear them. And then there's test anxiety. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I was in private practice, I would say that uh, social anxiety was my most common theme. And then uh, loneliness too. I, I treated so many single people who weren't in relationships. Uh, they, they had maybe been divorced and didn't know how to get into the dating game, or they'd never gotten into relationships in the first place because they were so social anxiety. And I had such intense social anxiety when I was young also. Uh, so I, it's my favorite thing for, for that reason, because I can identify with 
so many of the symptoms. And I think so frequently it actually leads to depression, right? So we'll see patients who have experienced social anxiety and as a result, isolated or uh, declined opportunities, right? Personally, professionally, um, or have very few friends, uh, don't date, et cetera. And of course, that level of sort of isolation, loneliness, shame oftentimes then leads to depression. So helping people with social anxiety, oftentimes you see a big alleviation in their um, anxiety symptoms, but lots of times like a really big mood elevation as well. Right, right. Um, so, um, oh, I was going to say, should we talk about, David, did you want to talk about why um, we, why I was kind of proposing the topic of this podcast, uh, uh, other than the fact that we have this cool upcoming workshop? Well, that, well, maybe we, let's tell them what the podcast topic is let's do it so What's actually the podcast the, topic Rhonda <laughs> <laughs> the podcast topic is social anxiety right and specifically I mean we'll talk a little bit about um you know cognition and thoughts and things like that but really specifically what I had said to David was wouldn't it be fun to do a podcast really focusing on a lot of the exposure methods, a lot of the sort of the stuff that a lot of therapists don't know and don't do, like getting out of the office um, with your patients, right? And so specifically, what I, what I had said to David was kind of like, um, you know, if you have a patient with social anxiety, um, all the cognitive therapy in the world, right? The best cognitive therapy in the world. You can have your patient somehow, you know, not believing their distorted thoughts, but if they're not willing to go out there and change their behavior, right? Test out their beliefs, talk to people, ask questions, be goofy in public, you know, then they're really no better off, right? I mean, if they're not, if they're thinking differently, but they're not behaving differently, then they're probably not going to end up feeling much better. And so, um, you know, as a therapist, I just think it's actually really uh, exciting to have these sort of exposure and interpersonal exposure methods in your toolbox so you can help your patients get fully recovered from social anxiety. Let's talk about some of those methods along with uh, some of the, the uh, resistance that both therapists have to using exposure techniques as well as uh, the patients themselves. Sounds good. So, I'm on yeah. another list. I'm on another listserv that's not related to Team CBT. I think I've mentioned it before that somebody posted something, a question about exposure, and then there was just all of this conversation back and forth online about how exposure is outdated and people aren't doing it anymore, and you know, it was very discouraged. Huh. That well, sounds. sounds Strange to me. Rhonda. Yeah, it sounds like baloney to me. Uh, well, I think that's right. based on the on people's fear. You know, yeah. the yeah. fear. If you look up, if you do like a Google search and you're trying to look for research that supports uh, you know, evidence for CBT for social anxiety, all of those treatments will involve exposure therapy, you know? Um so, and even like ACT, you know, acceptance and commitment therapy um, has a huge emphasis on behavior change, right? It's definitely, it's a, it's not a very cognitive therapy, but it's very much on changing your behaviors on getting out there. And even if it's not exactly exposure for the purpose of, let's say, habituation or getting less anxious, it's still exposure for the purpose of enhancing your life, right? It's, it's behavioral. Um, so yeah, that's super surprising to me to think it's it's outdated. I wonder what how do we help patients to change their behaviors and start living their lives differently without getting them to change their behaviors? Well, let's get into <laughs> some specifics of uh, techniques and that we use exposure yeah. techniques, mo motivational uh, te techniques. Um, but I would say it's impossible to be cured of any form of anxiety without exposure. Exposure right. is not a treatment for any type of anxiety. It's just a tool among many others in our toolbox. But it, it, it's a tool that must be a part of the treatment package. And, and I think a lot of times the people who don't use exposure, they just think the treatment is hanging out with people and talking for months and months and months and, and maybe sounds cynical but it's true getting paid for that so you're you're really uh, kind of motivated uh, it's just kind of a corruption thing because if if you use a technique that doesn't work and you have a full fee patient and 
you you need patience. Uh, I mean, there's a kind of an incentive just to talk and schmooze and explore childhood. But for, what I'm interested in as a therapist is is not only improvement but cure. And I mentioned that in a seminar to some of the Stanford residents, and they got really prickly, and they said, "Well, what do you mean by cure? You know, as if this was a four letter." word or form of <laughs> pornography or something like like that that I was advocating. And I said, well, you know, there's a, a 100% cure and a 200% cure. The 100% cure is when all your symptoms vanish and go to zero. And I know what that's like because I've had so many, I've had 15 kinds of social anxiety. And I know what it's like to 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 get out of that, to 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 be cured of that. That that's a a hundred percent cure. You have no symptoms whatsoever, and that change happens fast, not after months and months of exploring your past. And then the two hundred percent cure is when you fall in love with the very thing that you, that you were afraid of. Uh, when when I was young, you know, one of my many phobias and one that's creeped back, unfortunately, in my old age, but was fear of heights, and I overcame it you know, by standing on the top of a ladder for 15 minutes with one of my uh, teachers, because I, I wanted to be on, you know, on the, uh, you know, w work on the play where you work on the set and everything. Uh, they were putting on Brigadoon. He says, well, we can't have any uh, kids, you know, who are afraid of heights. And so, but he said, if you'd be willing to get over it, you know, you could be on the stage crew. I said, yeah, I want to get over it. So he just had me stand on the top of this V ladder for about 15 minutes and he stood down below. I think his social support mm -hmm. was important, but I was terrified for about 15 minutes. And then all of a sudden it, it went to zero. Yeah. And I, I said, Mr. Krishak, I think I'm cured. I'm not afraid <laughs> anymore. He says, good. You can be on the stage crew. Come on down off the ladder. But then when I got on the stage crew, I, I had to go up and work with the lights near the ceiling and the curtains and I, I fell in love with it. And I said, man, this is better than, you know, orange marmalade or something like, like that. And I couldn't even remember how I had been afraid, how or why I'd been afraid of, of heights. Uh, so, uh, the, 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 when I work with people with social anxiety, I'm, I'm after a total transformation of the person, not, not just helping them a, a little bit. And, uh, so that that that's that's yeah. one point, and now there's something so, else really to say, which Jill will say. Well, David, you and I were talking about um, maybe talking a little bit about the cognitive therapy angle very briefly, kind of like how we, and then and then talking a little bit more about all the different social, all the different exposure strategies. We're going to talk about the example of your patient, Jason. So. Yeah. Um, just to sort of start out briefly with the idea that it, it is very helpful to do cognitive therapy, meaning to help patients to identify their distorted thoughts that are driving their social anxiety before going out and doing exposure. And again, as David said, exposure is not something we throw at our patients. It's just a component of effective therapy. And so um, when we do, you know, we like to start out with using a daily mood log with the patient where we're helping the patient to identify a specific social situation that they're afraid of and identify their specific anxious thoughts, right? Like what it is that's going through their head that's causing them to feel anxious, looking at their distortions and kind of challenging those anxious thoughts using some cognitive therapy strategies. And also, first of all, my opinion is that that is really helpful because it builds rapport and it builds trust, right? So when a patient comes into therapy, we're not just like, you know, I mean, some therapists will be like, great, let's go out there right now and start facing your fears. And we can talk about that too. But a lot of times it requires at least some, um, you know, empathizing and um identifying resistance, and then even some cognitive therapy to kind of build trust and rapport. And then when we do the cognitive therapy, we can identify what it is the patient's most afraid of. So for example, if they're afraid of making a fool of themselves in public, then we kind of know that is what we need to target, right? We need to bring them into a public place and have them do something kind of goofy and realize that nothing awful happens. You know, if they're afraid that someone's going to say, you know, you talk too slowly, I can't understand you, then we might have know now that we're going to target that specific fear you know, in an exposure exercise. Um, so David, did you, do you had an example you wanted to talk about with that? Well, it was kind of a fun one. It was this uh, fellow, he wanted me to help him with his uh, social anxiety. He was uh, 
young. He was in his early 20s, and he was personable, and I thought he was good-looking. It's hard for me to judge with a guy if they're good-looking or not, but I thought he was, you know, good-looking and and funny and intelligent and and really nice, but he was just terrified of, of, of you know, flirting or asking women out and he and he was also ashamed and kind of hated himself for having this problem and that shame almost always goes hand in hand with with social anxiety and and so for his daily mood log he focused on a moment when he was at the supermarket Safeway I think on a Saturday and there was a line of people waiting to check their groceries and while he was waiting in line he thought the woman checking the groceries uh, might have been giving him the eye, and and he thought, well, gosh, maybe I could just flirt with her a little bit, and uh, that'd be huge because I'm always wimping out. And uh, and and then as he got closer and closer in line, he started to be flooded with negative thoughts, like, gosh, if I try to flirt with her, and she'll probably reject me, and that will prove that that, that I'm a loser. And then, uh, uh, you know, all the people in line will probably judge me and look down on me if I if I try to talk to her. They'll think I'm too forward. And 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 then he was telling himself things like I'm I'm too superficial. I I shouldn't be attracted to to attractive women. I thought that was good, a good one. Yes, son, turn off that. So you're right. never attracted to someone. Shouldn't ever be attracted to attractive people. Um, and, 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 you know, he, he was just beating up on himself, uh, t- terribly and, uh, and it was, uh, kind of fun, you know, helping him talk, talk back to his, ne- his negative thoughts, like the, uh, the idea that if, if she doesn't respond to me, that'll prove that I'm a loser. And I said, well, can you think of any other reasons why a woman working at a Safeway store might not respond positively to a, a customer who's trying to flirt with her and then together we came up with a list of you know 10 12 14 reasons like maybe she's gay maybe it's against store policy maybe she's sick maybe she's uh, socially anxious or maybe herself. she already has a boyfriend yeah. or a girlfriend yeah yeah maybe and, she's and, shy and doesn't want to date right yeah yeah may, maybe she i'm not her cup of tea you know may, uh, maybe she likes right. a certain kind of guy with a certain totally. kind of look or what, whatever and uh so that 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 was very uh, very helpful uh, for him and then with regard to this thought, if she doesn't respond to me, you know, you know, there, there's another possibility too. you know, it, it doesn't mean he came to see it doesn't mean you're a loser, but it might mean that you're not very good at flirting because you've never mm-hmm. done it. You know, you're right. a novice. And so you'll probably be anxious and awkward. And would that be OK uh, to, to, you know, just to say hello to her, uh, something like like that. But this was all in retrospect that we did this. And. It was it was a real relief to him because what happened to him when he got in line he got up to the to the front of the cash of the line and he was so scared he didn't even look her in the eye he just stared at the counter and she said that'll be nine dollars and ninety six cents so he handed her a ten dollar bill without catching her eye he got his four cents and walked out of the store fe- feeling like a, a total loser and uh, he says I'm just always wimping out and and that type of thing. Another thing that was helpful to him was, uh, but but let me just to make a long story short, say we worked through all of his negative thoughts and right. we can give you another example of, of uh, a technique that was really helpful to him. And to be but, clear, the story you just told of him walking through the grocery, that was not exposure. For our listeners, we're just right. talking about the cognitive therapy piece, kind of dissecting what happened when he was in a situation that did not go well, right? What all of his negative thoughts. And it's so clear that when you have these negative thoughts, when you're telling yourself, I'm going to be rejected, she's going to think I'm a loser, everyone's going to laugh at me, everyone's going to think I'm too forward, then of course you're going to avoid eye contact, look down at the ground, and then feel like a loser, right? It's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right, right. uh-huh. And and there's also two um, dysfunctional underlying beliefs in all social anxiety, the brush fire fallacy and the spotlight fallacy. And he was involved in both of them. The spotlight fallacy is everyone's looking at you and thinking you're so important. 
and, right. and, and really caring as if people are really going to care if you if a young man you know tries to flirt <laughs> with it right. 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 like i'm buying my groceries and somehow it impacts me in any way like to see someone flirting with someone else right exactly right exactly. like i and actually then, don't care yeah and then if one person judges me they're all going to judge me it'll spread through palo alto and you know it'll be right. in the morning paper young man tried to flirt with cashier got rejected thousands flee in horror that type of thing and, <laughs> and that's <laughs> really, the the brush fire fallacy though. yeah that's the brush right. fire fallacy that you know disapproval and rejection is so so terrifying right so a, a tech we, we, he, he was also afraid that there'd be some real studly guys in the line Mm -hmm. who would see him trying to flirt and then would be judging him as being mm -hmm. uncool uh, type of thing. And so we did a couple feared fantasies on that too. And if you want, we could do one of those. Either one feared fantasy we did was, uh, let's say that you uh, go to the grocery store from hell and the people in the in that line do see you trying to flirt with the young woman and, and they judge you. They think you're morally horrible and the other mm -hmm. suppose some guys saw you and, and thought you weren't very cool at your flirting skills you know would you like to meet one of those monsters which one should we do joe either one they both sound good you pick one we'll let we'll let Rhonda pick one um okay where they see you as a monster oh okay so do you want to be the uh the, the monster jill or do you want or do you want me to be the monster? Which who will uh, be Jason and who will be the the people from? You know, I will be Jason, and you can be the Jason. the, the judgy people from hell. Yeah. Now, in this technique, this is a fantasy technique. This is not preparation for real life because this type of thing where you're going to see doesn't happen in real life. But he's afraid that people in the line are going to judge him for flirting with a young woman. And uh, like they're real religious fanatics or something like that. And so uh, that's the role I'll play. Okay. And Jill will play the role of, of Jason, just so you see how this works. Young man, could, could, could I uh, speak with you for a minute? Oh, sure. Yeah. Several of us uh, saw you uh, flirting with that young woman. And, and I want you to know that we're, we're judging you real severely for doing that. That was a morally bad thing to do. Oh man, that that's a little scary for me. Um, kind of flirting is, is new to me. I've been trying to kind of get out of my shell and not take myself so seriously. Um, what, what, what was it that I did that was so morally reprehensible? Was well, it we just think that's bad to, to, to talk to people in public. In fact, I, I think you were probably having sexual thoughts about her. Were you having sexual thoughts about her? Yeah, I, I actually was. I think she's kind of cute and it's sort of my human nature. I don't, were you thinking that there were a lot of like 20 year old guys who didn't have thoughts about, you know, someone they're attracted to? Is that, is that a bad thing? So who's winning? <laughs> I think I'm winning. Big or small? Um, huge. Yeah, that, that, that's right. And so this was very helpful to him because he'd never thought about this. And then he began to see how how ridiculous it was. And then I gave him a, a lot of assignments that, and I negotiated this with him ahead of time using the general ultimatum and stuff that we can mm -hmm. describe. But, I, but I, I told him I wanted him to collect as many rejections as possible each week. And he, he was to approach uh, young women, introduce himself, uh, see if he could get a date, see if he could get a, a phone number. Or you can tell them, I'm trying to get rejected to get over my fear of rejection. There's a lot of ways you you can do it, but that he had to do that. And if he if he got rejected, he could get a point for each person he talked to. But if he didn't get rejected, if he got a date or something, he didn't get any points. His goal was to get rejected as often as possible. And, and uh, I was just going to say, David, that rejection practice, which you're talking about while you're mentioning it, we could tell people a little bit more about it. Like, I think we'll oftentimes, David, you would probably coach him or or maybe role playing with him, kind of what to say if you were to go up to a girl to try to get rejected, right? Like, mm -hmm. 
and again, as you said, you can do it in, in probably, I mean, there's probably many ways you could do it, but the goal is to get rejected, to collect rejections, because ultimately the goal is to not care, right? To think, yeah. of course, I mean, I always tell my patients, it's really a numbers game, right? Everybody that you ask out or everybody that you go out with isn't going to like you. That's You're not going to like uh, everybody that you go out with either. And so you just have to kind of be willing to um, get rejected, you know, have a whole bunch of mismatches in order to actually have a match, right? So yeah. either they can practice kind of going up to someone and saying, you know, I think you're cute. Would, would you be willing to go out with me? Or would you like to get coffee with me? Or can I have your number? Um, and, and ideally, the person says, you know, no, I'm not interested. And they kind of through lots and lots of practice, they get a thicker skin, right? Or as you were saying, they could instead go up to someone and say, um, you know, I've been trying to work on getting over my social anxiety and shyness. And one of the things I'm most afraid of actually is people rejecting me. So would you mind if I just asked you out and you rejected me? I'm just trying to collect like five rejections today. Could you be my, my fifth? Um, and that's kind of a nice upbeat way of doing it too. It doesn't make the other person feel too uncomfortable. And then you, the, they're, they're usually like, okay. <laughs> and you say, okay, great. Would you be willing to go out with me? You just have to say no, you know, and then, and then they collect a rejection. But, and a lot of times with the latter, because it's sort of humorous and not taking yourself too seriously, people will be curious and start to ask questions. What is, what is this you're doing? What's this about? And, and sometimes, you know, unfortunately or fortunately they don't get rejected and and start sort of strike up a conversation yeah in fact we had a podcast on kai chen from our tuesday group and and uh, chan marie also from the tuesday group and kai, kai uh forced himself to do that rejection yeah. practice and when chan marie found out about it she fell in love with him because she yeah. thought he was so courageous and now they're they're quite a number but with the uh, with Jason, he he was courageous because I had gotten an irreversible guarantee from him. I said I won't work with you unless you agree to do some pretty scary things, and if you uh, agree, there's almost no way that we can fail. And he then he went out. He started getting collecting his rejections, but he he got a number of acceptances too, and started dating and. Three or four weeks later, he terminated therapy, and he was he was on his way. It was yeah. really a fun thing, um, but I I was sad too because you know I was getting to like him, and that's that's <laughs> what happens. That's the story of my career of people re responding rapidly just about the time I'm getting to know them. Yeah, and but then I I wouldn't have it any any other way. And one other thing, I don't remember if you did this with Jason, but the rejection practice is actually one of the scarier ones, I would say. I mean, there's a couple scary methods that we have yeah. that are super powerful. Rejection practice is, is hard um, for people, although once they get the hang of it, I think it goes you know, pretty easily. It's one of those things that's like you have so much anticipatory anxiety about, but when you get out there and you just start, it's actually not that hard. But for example, David... Um, oftentimes we'll start with something really kind of gentle and it's hard for people, but it's much easier than um, rejection practice, which is just smile and hello practice. Right. So yeah, um, that is when oftentimes I will take patients out of the office and I'll um, go to somewhere like it, I, there, my uh, office at feeling good Institute is in Mountain View. So we'll go to Castro street in Mountain View, which is kind of a busy street with lots of restaurants. And so we'll go there and then I'll say, I want you to, we're going to walk down the street, you know, five blocks and every single person that we pass, I want you to make eye contact with them, smile and say hi. Um, and the benefit of, of doing that with your patient is you actually get to see them do it. So if they're looking down at their feet and avoiding eye contact, you can kind of prompt them. Nope, I want you to make eye contact with, you know, every single person if they're saying you know, like, hi, under their breath. I'm like, okay, no, I want you to, you know, have a more jovial voice, right? Like, say it louder, like, say it like you mean it, and you can kind of coach and counsel your patient. Um, and again, that's one that I think starts off kind of scary, but, you know, by the end of an hour of set, smiling and saying hello to every single person, no matter what, um, people really get over their fear, right? And yeah. Kind yeah. of fun. Yes, it is. And this is where a therapeutic, the therapeutic alliance, the trust and therapeutic relationship is so important for the following reason. Your patient's going to wimp out at the last minute. And this is one time where the, where the therapist really has to be pushy and 
and and have the courage of your your convictions. I was uh, treating a young man from India, and uh, he he was intensely shy, and uh, he he thought that uh, Americans were looking down on him because he had dark hair and long he had lo long hair and dark skin. And and so he was afraid to catch anyone's eye, and every now and then he'd get so angry about how unfair it was that people were judging him that he'd look up and angrily at somebody and kind of make a bad face back. And of course, then they'd get all shocked and they'd, with you know, look look hor horrified, and and that reinforced his belief that they had been uh, judging him. Mm -hmm. And uh, my wife uh, Melanie was working in our clinic. She was doing her clinical psychology work at Penn. And this was her practicum. And she happened to be working with him too. And she was running into, into the same intense resistance that, that I was. He refused. He said he couldn't and wouldn't do the smile and hello practice. And he, he was very, very stubborn about it. And so we got him in the, in, 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 into a kind of a co-therapy uh, session. And we we told him uh, essentially. I mean, it sounds kind of cruel, but we, we told him if if you don't do this, uh, it, we're not going to be able to continue working with you uh, on, on this problem because it, that, that this is absolutely a requirement. And not only you're going to have to do it, you're going to have to start today. And not only you're going to have to start today, you're going to have to start the moment you walk out of the office into the waiting room. There will be people right there. You have to smile and 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 say hello to them right right away. And we really had had to to pressure him like crazy. I mean, it it, it seemed like we we were being cruel, but it, it really was not cruel. But uh, he came back the next week. And, and I might also say we knew it would work because we knew what a charming fellow he actually was. We yeah. both liked him a lot. He was very warm. He had a good sense of humor. He's, he, he was a good talker. He just had to get over that hump. When he came back the next week, he 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 said that he was ready to terminate therapy, that he'd become a a, a, a ladies' man, that he he had been out dancing almost every night, that that he had many many girlfriends, and he was just on on top of the world. And I think a lot of therapists in the general public get angry when I talk about these rapid cures, uh, dramatic rapid cures. But that's not what always happens, but that's that often ha happens. And but it, it takes courage on the part of the therapist and on the part of the patient to to defeat these fears because it's terrifying. I've had so much anxiety and panic myself. It's it's very aversive and, and you know and, and, and horrifying. And and so we have to tell the patients, I'll, I'll, I'll be there. It's, we, we do more outdoors now with patients than I used to. It was just occasionally when I was in Philadelphia, but now I'm, I'm always working in the real world. I don't even see people in an office anymore. I see them on hikes and, and you know, wherever they, they happen to be. And they say, let's do it right now. Here's somebody go and talk to that person and, yeah. and that, and that type of thing. It's such a, it's such a fun an area. What are some of the reasons? Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so I, I brought this up with a client recently and he said, people are basically nice. And he expected everybody that he smiled, that he looked at and smiled to would smile back at him. So why would he trust that that was a, why would he trust their response? And I yeah. said, go ahead. Uh, should, should I tell you what I would say? Okay. Are you, are, do you want to keep bullshitting or do you want to go outside and get cured right now? <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'd say. Okay. I sort of, I didn't quite say that, but I said, the point isn't, <laughs> the point isn't their response. The point is for you to practice Yeah. and feel anxious and get over that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and furthermore, if you anticipate a positive response from people, then why would that be an anxiety producing thing to do at all? I mean, if he's saying, I expect people to be nice and why would you ever avoid that? Well, well, he, yeah, exactly. Well, he was not trusting that he, if people that people were being sincerely nice, they were just doing that to appease him. Mm -hmm. So it was a yeah. you know he wasn't trusting that's, relationship. That's, that's, that might be. I mean, and, and then I might say, what is it that like? So so if people are going to fake nice, then like 
would they fake nice a 10 minute conversation with you? Like at what point are people going to reveal their true meanness? Like what is it or true negativeness? Like what is it that he's afraid if he's not afraid of people rejecting him when he smiles and says hello, what is he actually afraid of and how mm-hmm. can you get him to engage in that, right? Okay. Either in the real world or theoretically you could do a feared fantasy as David and I just did. But if if he's not afraid to smile and hello, like to get out there and do that, that doesn't cause him any anxiety, then obviously we're not going to waste time doing it. You know, we could try it and prove that he's willing to do it. It's not going to not gonna help him though if that's not what causes his anxiety i'd be asking him what are you afraid of like at what point are you afraid people will reveal their true colors and hurt you right and then Uh let's work on that okay great thanks but the opposite can also be a problem and i cover people for uh, two because what if people don't smile back and, Mm -hmm. and say hello and uh i had a fellow tony bates who was at my clinic in philadelphia and we had a chance to go up to New York and be on the Phil Donahue show. That was the thing that really put feeling good on the map because it mm-hmm. became a bestseller within 15 minutes of the airing of that show after eight years of an- anonymous unimportance. It really hit the big time. But before the show, I said, let's let's walk around. I think it's Rockefeller Plaza there where CBS is or wherever. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. And and so I said, let's just do smile and hello practice. And mm-hmm. and we walked just around this this plaza, kind of around a block or something. And we smiled and said hello to 50 people and not a single one smiled and said hello back. So I sometimes tell that to people too. You know, it depends on, you know, where you live and w- what's happening. But the idea is, is to do it. I mean, it wasn't the end of the world at all. Um, but, right. Uh, and that, that can I've, I've never had that happen. That's a pretty extreme example. But, uh, you know, like New Yorkers must have been pretty busy that morning. But um, but I have definitely tell people that you'll probably get a range of responses. Right. Some people yeah. might be pleasantly surprised and go, oh, hey, some people might give you a little weird look like, what do you want from me? Like, why are you saying hi to me? You know, some people might be busy on their phone and you say, Swan hello, and they get startled, right? I mean, people will have a range of reactions. Um, and part yeah. of part of the goal is to be to to kind of roll with it, right? Like to, yeah. to get used to that, to be okay. You can think about it as, you know, you're kind of like collecting data, but ultimately you want to be comfortable with the fact that people will, some people will smile and and be their day is improved by it, and others will be you know surprised or not care and that's you know that's okay too yeah the um uh, uh, one of the th- this is just one technique out of many by the way but uh the the one of the rules we have is you're not allowed to uh ask a patient to do something that you yourself would not right. do. And that's that's why if you're a therapist and you come to this workshop, you're going to have to do your own work, too, if you want to have real, real credibility. I was working with a Stanford psychiatric resident who was treating a uh, a student with the uh, he was uh, he had the fear of uh, peeing in his pants. And so. He'd be running out of classes uh, halfway through and running to the bathroom just to see if he had to go to the bathroom. He was totally obsessed with, with this. Mm. And and I, I told her, well, uh, have him just, uh, you know, splash some 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 water uh, on his on his pants and then walk around campus. Say, oh, look at me. I just peed in my pants. And and she was so so terrified of of that uh uh that she refused to do it she thought this was like the end of the world this is this fear that therapists have of of exposure and and i was on my sunday hike and i got to thinking about that thinking is is did it was that a cruel suggestion uh to to ask somebody to, to do something like that and uh our our hiking group was going downhill and this other group was coming uphill. And I said, I think I'm going to, uh, you know, ch- ch- check it out right now. So I got so- some water. Somebody had some water. I put, splashed it all over me. And then as the other people uh, came, I pointed and, and, and I said, uh, oh, I just peed in my pants. 
And then they shouted out, we're going to pee in our pants too. <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> believe it. And then I noticed that Jeff Lazarus uh, wasn't, wasn't with us. He's one of the guys in our Tuesday group. He's mm-hmm. a local uh, uh, hypnotherapist, pediatrician, uh, re- really neat guy. And, uh, and, and I said, what, what happened to Jeff? And, they, they, and somebody said, oh, he, he's, behind, he's behind a tree. I think he's taking a leak. <laughs> and, and so I shouted out, Jeff, what, what are you doing behind that tree? And he shouted out, I'm masturbating. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> That's called a shame attack. Uh, he, he wasn't, for those of you who don't understand, he right. was just acting It was a joke. Outrageous. He was not actually doing that. I just so yeah. <laughs> I don't but, think uh, we have really insane heights that we go on, but. But the when, goal when you, of that is to not take yourself so seriously. Right? Yeah, and, if you're yeah, one, I do think we probably need to go over a couple yeah, of the, the goals sure. of, of doing the exposure, right? We're not just kooky people who like to do wacky things, although maybe, maybe, maybe one of us are. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, the purpose, right, David, in that, for example, is to not get to, to help someone to not take themselves so seriously, right? You can yeah. live your life in fear and paralyze and do tons of avoidance and distraction and hiding, right? Or you can sort of decide that the world doesn't have to be so serious. I can sometimes show my flaws or my vulnerabilities or my, you know, mess ups and the the world doesn't end, that no one really cares. Everyone's you yeah. know, doing their own thing. And sometimes not only do they not care, but they think it's funny or they yeah. like you more when they see your flaws or your vulnerabilities, right? Yeah. What are some of the reasons, Jill and uh, Rhonda, that ther- some therapists are so afraid of exposure? Because I'd say a good 75% of therapists are fear exposure. And uh, in fact, I was suggesting exposure to somebody who was helping for free, uh, someone in Europe who also went to a therapist and, and I wanted her to uh, you know, do, do some exposure, confront some of her ther- fears and I said, if you want, you can, you know, I ask your, your therapist about it. And the therapist said, oh, you mustn't do that. That, that would be cruel. Mm-hmm. Uh, that it's, exposure is just a cruel thing. But fortunately, she went ahead and did it anyway and overcame some of her fears. And now she's going to c- confront her, her worst fear of all. She's been resisting for a year. And she just emailed me today that she's finally, finally decided um, it's revealing something about herself to her children that she's been hiding but something happened when she was a teenager Mm -hmm. and i was so heartwarmed today when i heard when she emailed me and say she's finally decided she's gonna do it this coming weekend they're going Mm -hmm. camping and she's gonna reveal this thing to her her children which to my way of thinking it isn't a terrible thing at all but it's something she's been profoundly ashamed of but I think it's going to be a life changing experience for her. And, well, maybe uh, that's what I, I wanted. Maybe that's what I meant by bringing up that, the list, that other list serve that where they said it's outmoded. Yeah, right. It's based exactly. on fear. So I knew you were going to ask that question. So I've come up with four reasons. Oh, good. good. <laughs> Besides that exposure is cruel, what you, and that making patients accountable is crude. Um, I think, I think therapists worry that, we won't be able to do the exposure correctly and we might reinforce the anxiety instead of helping them overcome it. That we will feel anxious. We'll feel so anxious as we're going through exposure that we'll pass our anxiety onto our patient mm. and um, that, that can it. happen. And that's why you have to do your own work as a therapist first. Yeah. Otherwise you have no credibility when treating somebody else that says physician heal thyself is some biblical thing. And I, I feel strongly Strongly right. In fact, if, if therapists have um, a fear, you know, doing exposure for themselves and working on getting over their fear, certainly, obviously, if a therapist has social anxiety, then having them use the strategies on themselves, right? Doing smile and hello practice or, yeah. or giving presentations. Same attacking or, exercises or whatever it happens to be. Tell us, Jill, I, I, I'm a therapist here and I'm, I'm thinking, how do I get my patients to do exposure? Because none of them want to do exposure. How, how, what, what trick do you team CBT therapists use to get people to do exposure? Right. Okay. So, well, first I would say this would, the therapist wants to get some training, right? So you want to make sure that you actually do have some training in doing exposure, right? You know what you're going to do, what your plan is, et cetera. So 
you can come to our workshop and get some training. You can follow up with colleagues and do consultation, right? So this is assuming it's a therapist who, you know, feels somewhat confident then in doing exposure with their patients. Um, what I essentially do is I let my patients know that um, exposure is kind of the active ingredient in getting over your anxiety. There are these other strategies that we can use that are helpful, right? But if you want to change your life, if you want to um, feel more connected to people or um, get over your shame of talking to people in public, really the only way to do that is to get out of the office and uh, and face your fears. And I basically say, I would, I always say this to you, David, like, I feel that holding my patients accountable is the most kind and compassionate move I could possibly make because the alternative is stringing patients along in endless therapy that's not actually going to help them to get better. And to me, what that actually communicates is that therapy is not very effective, right? So I feel like instead, what I do is hold patients feet to the fire. I say, let's say we've been working for a bit and we've done some cognitive therapy, I might say, look, I, I think we've gotten as far as we can get with the tools that we have. And in order to overcome your social anxiety, you're going to need to get out there and face your fear. And it's going to be kind of scary, but I'm going to be with you every step of the way. And I have total confidence that if we do this, that you actually will overcome your social anxiety. And then I can do what we call sitting with open hands, right? I can say, if you're, if you're willing to do that, let's do it. I'm with you. I, I want to go do that with you right now. If you're not willing to do that, you know, I, I would understand it's absolutely your choice, but then I can't see us getting you much better than you're at right now. I don't think there's anything else that you can do at this point to actually overcome your anxiety. Um, and then I often will say, and I, I don't feel good about stringing you along in therapy, right? I feel like I've, I've given you all I have to offer. So let's go out there and do the exposure and get you over your fear. If not, um, then we might be done, you know, with our, our treatment, because I don't think there's kind of anything else that's going to get you there. Right. And that's called the gentle ultimatum. And, and I think you do it in a very warm and, and ethical way. But that raises the ire of therapists, too. And, uh, I, you know, I've talked to some people at, at Stanford, where I'm on the voluntary faculty, and you are too, Jill, who mm -hmm. are have... I would say rage toward uh, Team CBT because of this uh, idea of holding patients accountable and issuing the gentle ult ultimatum. And if you're depressed and you want me to work with you, you're going to have to agree to do the psychotherapy homework. It's not negotiable. Right. And and if you're anxious, uh, you're going to have to, if if you want me to work with you, I don't know how to cure people without exposure. And I really want to work with you. But if you want to work with me, then exposure is not negotiable. You'll, you'll mm -hmm. have to do it. And I'll be with you. I'll, I'll be right, right, right there. Um, but it is going to be scary at first. And, and is that something you're willing to do if okay. I agree to work with you? And the idea is if I agree to work with you, not, I'm not going to try to persuade you to do exposure. It's just the gentle ultimatum. That's going to have to be a part of the of the treatment package. And, and yeah, I was going to say when I'm training therapists, and we we talk about this, this is called dangling the carrot, the gentle ultimatum, sitting with open hands and the fallback position. It's what we do to help patients to overcome their uh, resistance to doing exposure. Um, I, I what the analogy that I use with therapists, I say, you know, like, so, so a patient coming to see me and not being willing to do exposure, but thinking that they're going to get over their social anxiety is kind of like a patient who has pneumonia, who goes to see their primary care doctor. The primary care doctor says, oh, you have pneumonia. I know just how to treat you. Take this penicillin and you need to take it three times a day, every day for the next 10 days, and then you'll be better. And then the patient goes, well, I don't know, like, can you make me better without the penicillin? Or like, I guess I could take one a day, right? I mean, the doctor is like, hey, if you want to get over your pneumonia, you got to take penicillin, right? There's no other way to get over your pneumonia. And you don't think that that's not compassionate, right? Um, 
And so and if you I take one a day, day, you'll just make your gonna, bacteria you're, resistant same, and you'll right. actually get worse. Right. And you'll think that penicillin doesn't work, right? When actually right. it does if it's taken properly. And I think there's a total parallel to therapy. If you go to sort of a, a watered down version of therapy where your therapist is not requiring you to do the work they know is going to get you better. It's kind of like taking, you know, penicillin once a day, the the infection festers, right? Like the symptoms continue, they don't get better. And then you become more demoralized over time because you think therapy doesn't work and I'm a hopeless case and I won't actually get better, right? Versus kind of holding their feet to the fire, which is hard in the short term, hard for everyone in the short term, but makes, you know, it, it makes the patient get over it very, you know, quickly and, and completely. And also it makes for such a more, um, fulfilling practice, right? We actually see people get better and graduate from therapy, which I think is, you know, what's for me, that's what sustains me in this, um, in this profession is seeing people get better and seeing tools that I have to help people get better. But there's a lot of other tools we'll be teaching shame attacking exercises, flirting training, talk show host, uh, down what if technique you know, feared fantasy that we illustrated, just j just a ton of techniques. And so if you're struggling with social anxiety, or if you want to improve your skills at treating social anxiety, we would love to see you and hang out with you and laugh with you and have some fun and uh, share share the tricks of the trade in curing people with social anxiety on Sunday, October 2nd. And if you want to come uh, and register, you can go to cbtforsocialanxiety.com. That's one word, CBT, that's cognitive behavior therapy, but just the initial CBT for social anxiety, one big word, dot, dot com. And uh, it'll cost you about $138 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then there's an early bird special we can get it a uh, hundred hundred and eight dollars. It it's really a good deal. Seven continuing education credits and a lot of hands-on training in the small groups. You'll be practicing these these techniques, and it should be a very good day. And if you're there, it will be an even better day. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you so much, Jill and David. You know, wetting people's appetite for this workshop, but also giving some incredible and important information in this podcast it was it was wonderful to be a part to be a part of it and listening to you guys yeah thank you Rhonda thanks so much Rhonda and thank you David I, I um I'm a big fan of exposure and I've learned so much from you particularly um these skills for kind of what we call interpersonal exposure right which I yeah. think is a very specific kind of exposure and you've got so many awesome tools that I've learned from you so I'm excited to share them with people yeah, it's been fun teaching with both both of you, Rhonda and Jill, and it's just a gift to me to know you and to have you in, in my life. I feel very, very fortunate. I've learned tremendously from from both of you. Uh, and, and Rhonda, I just, every day I get emails from people telling me how, how fantastic you are on the podcast and from people in our Tuesday group singing your praises, Jill, every single Tuesday in the feedback. And mm -hmm. uh, you're very, very beloved, very loved and appreciated, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns' website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, the director of the Feeling Great Therapy Center. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.